I know I'm not alone when I say One Piece chapter 1086 is chapter of the year so far. I, I, okay, okay, okay. We, and, and we say that every week. I guess there's a testament to Oda and everything that's been happening so far in One Piece. But we, we got to have some order about this, right? So this chapter is going to be broken down. This review, rather, is going to be broken down into several parts because I anticipate this one being somewhat of a long one, okay? So magazine cover, Aftermath, Seraphim, the best One Piece theorist and Garling Valley, okay? Because that's, those are the sections of the chapter I think it's split into. And there's legitimately so much to talk about. So we're not gonna waste any time. So let's get into the magazine cover. On its surface, it's just Luffy, Garp, and Kobe. But for me, going through the story for so long, I see something different. I see Oda elevating a character and showing us that these characters are gonna play an important role going forward, but just expect something major to happen involving all these characters right now garp is fighting out kiji in hachinosu with kobe being there as well trying to save him and luffy's about to take on the the, the biggest fleet that we've seen so far in this story major things are happening now i don't want to read too much into it but it could spell doom for garp even though i think luffy has to meet him before he does die i don't think death is inevitable for him but being captured i think makes a lot of sense here considering what is the purpose of having this in a story as the writer kobe getting captured by blackbeard if it's much ado about nothing nobody gets hurt nobody gets captured garp goes and he saves kobe then we go away there has to be some reason and consequence behind it and oda based on his chapter as well 5d chess and there's a lot to get into but that's it with the cover art there's more to come about that but not in this video the best way i can describe the first part of the chapter is aftermath after sabo after emu after the gorosei after the reverie and now everything is hectic everybody is scrambling trying to figure out what to do and where to go slaves are running around of course we had admirals fighting admirals right cp0 is scrambling and now we focus on vivi and wapple and this is important because i went back and oda is great at this using timelines and manipulating them right because i went back and i reread the wapple vivi and big news section at this point vivi's aware her dad is dead and she seems to be over it big news talks about how she was crying a day prior but it set up a very important arc i think for someone like big news because we like him as a character we think he's very important in the one piece world he has very intricate character agency but wapple is somewhat growing on me i'm not gonna lie to you guys wapple is he's becoming likable i I don't know. Wapo has the logical reaction where he just saw something crazy. And Vivi's asking him, yo, what did you see? Like, yo, I don't want to talk about it. Why are you even here? I don't want to say anything. And essentially, he saw hell on earth with everything going on with Emu, Sabo, and the Gorosei. So he is terrified. Imagine, imagine, just hypothetically, if Emu has the devil fruit, as I suspect, and Sabo using fire, the Gorosei having some mythical zone fruits. Essentially, that's like a, a crazy warped version of hell that he saw. I'm with him. But again, this is the aftermath. Sabo's throwing away. Bonnie's throwing away. Now, Sabo, you worry about because he got messed up by Emu, man. But Sabo can't die, mainly because he's Ace's replacement. What did he say? I know that sounds bad, but a quick thing we want to talk about here. And I want to point this out, okay? A lot of the ideas that will be floated in this video, they are part or subsets of larger ideas that will be fleshed out over the, the next five weeks. So Sabo and the conversation about Sabo and Ace has been lingering over the past couple chapters considering Sabo's agency is growing his character profile is growing his character importance has grown he is the flame emperor for all intents and purposes regardless of nuance and context that is who he is and people are starting to compare the two saying hey is Sabo has he surpassed Ace as a character I don't think that's happened yet but I do think he's well on his way to showing why Oda kept him alive and why Oda brought him back he's someone carrying on the will of Cobra and we will talk about Sabo a bit more later based on what the Gorosei said about him, because I think this continues the theme of what Oda was talking about in the previous chapter, which I mentioned in my previous review. The D in the Will of D and what it actually means, what it stands for, and the meaning of it. Very important stuff. Quickly before we move on to the Elder Star section, I just gotta say, Vivian Wapple is not a combination or a duo I expected, but I'm really interested to see where they go going forward, considering the contrast, and again, the history behind the two. Do you guys remember? What Wapple did to Vivi back then? Where back then, Wapple, because of Cobra scolding him, he came out, he slapped Vivi, and Vivi responded in a more mature manner than him back then, which showed her grace, which Wapple should have been embarrassed by. And now look at him. He is throwing away with the, the same person that he persecuted back then. It's always important, right, man? Always important. You never know who you're gonna need and depend on. You never really know. So Oda, bringing it back and having Wapple and Vivi be or working together essentially <laughs> i love it i love it i love it but now to the other stars the other stars 
they are very nuanced, important characters considering the buildup. For the most part, the introduction was a pretty simple. It wasn't anything special, but over time, you understand just how important these people are and just how significant they are in regards to how the world turns. They did mention that the world bends the whim of Emu for the most part, but they are carrying out his will. So essentially, based on this chapter, it's it's a lot more apparent that Emu says things. He wants things done and they carry out his will. But for the Gora say, Emu does not care about consequence. He does not care about method. He only cares about results. And the Gora say they have to manage not only Emu's whims, Emu's will, but also the world government and the Marines, right? All that is tied into one and they have to manage all of that on both sides. So essentially Emu's the manager and they are his supervisors, right? And they have to carry out what the manager wants, regardless of how crazy it seems. So the Gora say sometimes their hands are actually tied and they look like the bad guys. But now we're seeing who the true bad guy is. And I don't feel sorry for the Gorosei at all because these people, they're doing this of their own will, we expect. Some questions popped up in my head this chapter. Who are these guys? Where did they come from? How did they get picked? And what is the end goal for them? Is it just about maintaining the balance, maintaining the world? We understand that's very important to them, but do they have any personal wishes? Do they have things that they would like to accomplish? Are they just bending themselves to Emu's will? Are they doing so willingly, happily? This chapter, it had some very interesting responses to Emu's wishes. We'll get to it. But first, we gotta talk about the subscribe button, okay? That, that, that's a subscribe button right there. If you're enjoying the review so far, sub to the channel because there's a lot more to come drop a like if you so please as well but seriously sabo mentioned it earlier based on sabo's actions and how sabo seemingly got out of the situation alive injured hurt but alive they're starting to compare sabo and how he seems to have the checkered fate of the d what does this mean are they saying that sabo is a d Oda said Sadibo in the last chapter, what does this mean? Well guys, I'm here to tell you that this is continuing what I expected from the last chapter. Sabo, for all intents and purposes, is a D, not by blood or lineage, but by life, way of life, actions, and choices. Sabo is a kid, of course he's a noble, but over time, when he was a child, he was essentially adopted by the Ds. Look who he was around for the most part, Luffy, Ace, Garp, and he essentially was adopted by those guys, by Dadan. He was taken in, and how he grew up is the same way actual Ds grew up in Luffy and Ace. So Sabo, for all intents and purposes, his lifestyle, all he knows, has been taken from two D clan members. So his actions, it's not surprising. Even his commander now in Dragon, he's a D as well. So Sabo and his actions and how he goes about things, it makes sense that they're looking at him like, wait, is, is he a D? Like, is, is checkered fate? But no, he's adopted by that. It goes back to what Oda was trying to convey. The D is not necessarily what you were born with, right? Cobra saying we are all Ds because we are all anti-establishment. We are all against him. And Sabo, there are few people against the government more than Sabo. So he's going to feel like that. But he wasn't born a D, but he's adopted it. He's lived his life that way. I mentioned Odin before. Not confirmed a D, but no one can say how Odin lived and died does not display D qualities sabo's the same way that's why they feel that way and they're gonna be a lot more people like that who aren't these but they convey they portray themselves that way that's how they carry themselves and for the world government this is the scariest thing because wait 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 so we just don't have to worry about the d clan members but there are people that for all intents and purposes are honorary d's yes yes there are and i think oda is getting this or driving this point home very well in my opinion it's funny the Gorosei talking about egghead and how they have to deal with the egghead issue with vegapunk and everything going on there which is foreshadowing saint j saturn going to see vegapunk and somewhat confirm the eradication of the punks sabo and everything that's going on they have to take pride it takes priority because it's happening in their backyard but then emu in the midst of it mentions the mother flame what is the mother flame well i'm assuming the mother flame is an invention or a knockoff for all intents and purposes of the flame the everlasting flame that vegapunk was talking about when we were in Egghead, that sun, that power source that he was so somewhat gung-ho on, he created a failure, right? A version of it that can be used maybe not for a long time. But I think this chapter somewhat encapsulates where Vegapunk is in the story and how important he is and how much he impacts the world, good or bad. A question I ask, and I want to ask you guys this as well to think about it. For Vegapunk, has he been a net positive or net negative for the world so far based on his inventions? What do you think? Let's say Dragon took him out back then when they met when they were younger. Would the world be better? Would it be worse? Think about what's transpired recently. 
we have Vegapunk creating the Seraphim, who are, we'll talk about those guys, but also he's created the Mother Flame, which seems to power a device, which we'll talk about, that just eradicated an entire nation. But Vegapunk has created the Climate Machine, different ways in which people can be fed and people can eat. Those things are not privy or available to the rest of the world. They are confined on Egghead. So therefore, has Vegapunk been a net positive? Think about also Vegapunk's group before then, Mads, right? Who was in Mads? Caesar judge queen have those guys contributed positively to the world because they have all taken something away from vegapunk and worked on it in their own specific niches has that been good for the world i don't think so something to think about a quick tangent just something i thought about when i was going through this chapter now back to the gorosei emu insists on testing this device right because they have the mother flame and something that more than likely well confirmed it was an invention by vegapunk and the mother flame more than likely is a less completed version of that power source the ancient kingdom was trying to create that more than likely powered the giants the dead ancient giant back then the metal giant thing he created a version of that now the girls said they're trying to discuss exactly where to test it where logically in the water in a forest somewhere and emu says lulushia kingdom we know the reasoning behind it already right that's why the timelines and manipulating them is ingenious by oda because for lulushia there's been an uprising we even find out later in the chapter which we'll again we'll get to as soon as sabo got there they mobbed and took the nobles the kings from lulushia kingdom so they were already in the middle of an uprising right so lulushia kingdom has been chosen but for the gorosei it's like okay you want us to do something so radical and we're going to be the ones on the hook for this because we have to find out our reasoning behind it or do we just act like it doesn't exist that's probably the easiest way and that's like, essentially what they did but emu's words here they're, they're powerful man first off how they're written in bold it just tells you just the command and the force behind it something i wanted to address as well again another quick tangent is shout out to my guy ardor from the library of ahara you know ardor is a, a japanese speaker he, he breaks down the story in a different way in which he can understand the 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 core or the raw language what what oda is trying to convey and in the chapter he said that emu's speech reminded him of somewhat of a child right it was childlike and for emu there's a theory floating around that emu could be a child or very young person and based on the best theorists in the world we will talk about that in that segment i don't think that's far-fetched but even in this chapter here emu does not care there's no care no remorse for anything first off lulushia kingdom is chosen secondly they're saying a, there's a lot of people there he said that is of no consequence meaning it does not matter and then the reasoning behind it is because well it's close which then goes back to the mother flame me thinking that well the mother flame was chosen simply because well one is a test two is not the completed version right it's a knockoff it's something that we can we can try it but we can't use it for a long time so you want to test it close by and that's what that's essentially what they did in lulushia kingdom Kingdom. but the question is because i don't think vegapunk created the actual machine he created the flame right that's the power source so what is the machine more than likely the ancient weapon that's what makes the most sense here because vegapunk the greatest mind in the world didn't create it he created a flame that makes things scary that they now have something that can power an ancient weapon and they even talked about it right and something that was funny that i wanted to point out is after emu insists on it being lulushia based on the proximity obviously again talking about the mother flame the, the gorosei then changed course they were not behind this initially they were even asking and questioning it then they changed course well first garcia says give us some time I i'll make it happen but then mars says they have been uprising lately right and so it shows you the dynamic and how they are going out of their way to serve and be subservient to emu i don't necessarily think it undermines the gorosei it just shows you how dark how scary how imposing emu is and how they don't really try to oppose him or her they even float around the idea of using this somewhat casually saying well we can use this on a whim imagine if we had a power like this we could use it anytime it makes their life a lot easier the bus the calls all this different stuff not as apparent but i like the fact that we get or we know that it's a test because when we saw Lelouchia get eradicated, we were like, well, what's the need for Bust to call? Why didn't they use that in Wano? But now we get our answer. This is a test. This is the first time using the Mother Flame. Once they perfect this, if they ever do, imagine the scare for the world, knowing that at any time, something could disappear. Now, initially we said, well, this is what happened to God Valley. No, it didn't, because this is the first time they're using this. So what happened to God Valley? Is that a foreshadow for what we're going to talk about later? Hmm, I, don't I don't know. Something that's important, I think, but not as impactful is we got the names of all the Gorosei. We knew Saturn. We have Mars, Valkyrie, which I'm assuming is Mercury. In my reaction, I... <laughs> In the moment, I didn't put two and two together, right? Because we have Venus Juro, and then we have Jupiter. And I kept reading it as Venus Juro, and then Jupiter. 
Peter. And it's like, wait, what, what are these names? Oda's just having fun with this, right? The names aren't as important, I think, as what they are responsible for. Now, St. J. Garcia Saturn, he's responsible for science defense or defense science, whatever. They're all listed as warrior gods though, which is interesting because Luffy is a sun god, they're warrior gods, they're based on the planets, the planets revolve around the sun, solar system, so more than likely they're mythical zomans as well. I wonder just how important and impactful they're going to be in regards to how it relates to Luffy's devil fruit. I don't know, but I think Oda is throwing hints based on what they're over and also the fact that they're based on actual planets on the planets the planets revolve around the sun and solar system so more than likely they're mythical zones as well i wonder just how important and impactful they're going to be in regards to how it relates to luffy's devil fruit i don't know but i think oda is throwing hints based on what they're over and also the fact that they're based on actual planets again i do think the things that they're over responsible for is important but not yet right because there's not anything to really base it off of in this chapter but i think in time knowing now what they're responsible for going back and looking at conversations and things that they've said it could tell us more about what they're interested in this makes me think about their lineage where did they come from how were they chosen warrior gods which essentially means that they have some strength to them at some point maybe now they are dangerous in different ways Ways, more ways than one i mentioned before in a previous video oda at one point did say the gorosei have not shown their true value yet he said that maybe we're seeing it now and there's a lot more to come this section does end off with emu asking for them to go retrieve vivi or telling them to do so not asking telling them. which is interesting considering what sabo just saw where vivi is still more important than sabo because something i spoke of and it hasn't been debunked as yet right that emu needs vivi's body i think it's pretty much confirmed that emu used the age of surgery but something as well using the opop no me another thing that you can use through the age of surgery is soul switching is emu trying to use vivi's body why is emu so hell-bent on retrieving vivi does she represent the rebellion is it an old grudge and because vivi is so much like nefertari lily emu wants to snuff it out whatever Lily did back then caused so many problems for Emu that just looking at Vivi and Vivi existing is such a problem for Emu, it has to cease. Vivi may just be one of the dominoes to fall in regards to the great cleansing. I mean, Lelouch already did, so I wonder what's next. Knowing that they have this power and the mother flame, what will they try next? Do they eradicate another country? Because there are several uprisings going on. For Dragon, and again, we'll talk about that section, this must be terrifying. let's talk about the seraphim and what it means based on their appearance in this chapter ever since egghead we were intrigued by the seraphim the seraphim has been holding off luffy rob lucci zoro sanji they've been doing such a great job considering how they've been created again vegapunk is in the middle of everything if you if you catch my drift every time i, I talk about something important something dastardly something not necessarily great for the world the vegapunk is in the middle of that now we see three new old seraphim right which tells me do we only have Seraphim based on the OG Warlords? Because we see Doflamingo here, Moria, and Crocodile. It's funny, while I was going through the chapter reacting, even when I talked about it, everybody was talking about Crocodile and Doflamingo. It's like they didn't see Moria. I understand. Moria is one of the more underwhelming characters in regards to strength. And when you compare it to Doflamingo and Crocodile, it's no contest. Moria is pretty strong. And Moria, for all intents and purposes, is the only Warlord that was doing his job. And now he's just childlike and happy here. No one cares about him. I mean, I'm a young, I don't, I don't either. I'm a Doflamingo guy and you know Crocodile I think his appearance here has led to some very interesting theories and we're not going to spend too much time on Moria let's get to Crocodile let's get to Crocodile seeing Crocodile here people have been starting to speculate about what's going on I, I, I must admit looking at Crocodile I have to say Crocodile looks very feminine is this on purpose we've seen Crocodile as a kid before it does not look this feminine to be honest now I don't think this confirms that crocodile or croco mom but i know oda knows about the theory and he might be just playing with us but something else is the scar is this just aesthetic crocodile did not have this scar as a kid when oda drew him does this have something to do with crocodile's lineage or his origins is crocodile originally a clone i i don't know the, the scar there just before aesthetic right the fact that he looks so feminine could be another thing could just be oda playing with us again but intriguing stuff and again we have a crocodile seraphim I'm interested in the, 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 the devil fruit though, because we know Crocodile has a Logia. They can't implement Logia with the Seraphim. So what is his devil fruit? I don't know. Could it be Pikas? That'd be interesting. What devil fruit makes the most sense? Let me ask you guys. You can let me know. Now we have the god, Doflamingo, right? And he looks like he just came from destroying an island. People are saying he reminds him of Kid Boo. I was saying uh, Crocodile remind, reminds me of Prolo, right? From Hunter Hunter. I am just really interested in the Seraphim. Now, initially, I did think Doflamingo was an egghead based off of 
just how many seraphim were there and the holding cells right the holding canisters you want to say we had up to six and there were only three there actually four s shark s hawk s bear and s snake we had six or seven of them at least in egghead so i thought they were there but they've already been deployed because while well, the navy have their they have their hands full and something we gotta point out as well the narrator was working this chapter right every single section the narrator is jumping in to let us know hey the marines have gone in a different direction right they've already moved on from the warlords the seraphim they've already been deployed which means that they're already terrorizing people if the seraphim goes to a a normal island there aren't many people in the world that can stand up to one of them they are destructive and dangerous and if they have the personality of someone like do flamingo i want to see him in action i know i love villains they they're dastardly but they make stories interesting so as a do flamingo stand even if it's s flamingo i'm happy my heart is full and seeing crocodile as well i feel good moria well, good luck now 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 let's talk about the best one piece theorists there is in this section we go back to sabo and dragon and ivankov and what we're talking about Sabo is giving us a retelling of the events from his perspective that we missed out on because he's telling them a story of what happened and Oda is going back again manipulating the timelines and telling us exactly what went down. We've seen everything up to this point so Sabo doesn't necessarily have to say it again so he's continuing from what we did not see. Essentially he gets to Lelouchia again like I mentioned they kidnapped the king and the queen and so they're praising him naturally because he's the flame emperor at this point and they were already inspired by Bello Betty and so a lot of people were already there not a lot a, a few hopefuls a few recruits were already there ready to go with sabo and he was ready to take them and accept them because the revolutionaries they always need people come to find out sabo is a lot smarter than we thought because once he was talking to dragon back then we we're like sabo don't you think they can trace you he knows that so he used an encryption essentially a vpn right and he did that to make them think he was still on lucia and then that happened of course he didn't expect them to destroy the entire island but they did they did they they, they traced the call destroyed lucia and sabo's like listen i don't know but i saw a shadow and then lucia was gone but then then, but then something i did not expect i thought shaka was a great theorist right thought dragon was a great theorist vegapunk even robin how they put things together insane no one no one is a better one piece theorist than ivankov not joy boy theories not ohara not grand line not even bda but ivankov ivankov was on our roll this chapter i I felt inspired. I wanted to go back and read Sky Pierce see if I could find something. The best One Piece theory you've ever seen? I guess so. <laughs> I, I don't know. It's almost like the fourth wall. Like, I'm watching, I'm like, yo, is Oda playing with us right now? Like, Ivankov. Okay, let's break down what Ivankov said. So, Ivankov, just like Cobra, picked up on the name Emu. And apparently, the name Emu is connected to the 20 kings from back then, like we talked about last chapter, saying, okay, this could be more than likely one of the 20 kings. It's not confirmed, but they said there was someone named Emu, right? From the house of Narona, and that's one of the first 20 sovereigns, right? First clue. So then Ivankov is putting two and two together like we have, saying, well, okay, there's this person from back then that seems to have existed for a long time, and we know there's an ability called the Eternal Youth Surgery, right? Where someone's out there that does not have to worry about death, and the fact that we know there's an ability like this means that it's been used before, right? 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 Ivankov then says, well, I mean, who else could control a command of celestial dragons, right? They are descendants of the gods, after all. Ivankov then thinks about the clouds again, saying, wait, 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 we saw something above the clouds, and if the world government made it, there's only one person that could have done that. That's Vegapunk. Veg dragons like, wait, 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 Eva, Eva, Eva. I don't think Vegapunk would make something like that. Based on their conversations, Vegapunk seems to care about people. But there's another side to him that cares about invention and innovation, regardless of people. But I, I don't think Dragon's wrong, though. But Eva, he's putting the pressure on. So then Eva makes a conclusion we all have. What if it was an ancient weapon? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what the Eva accent. <laughs> Eva's conclusions, I think, are correct. And that's where we've been going with it. And they're like, okay, if Emu has been living for so long, it makes sense. And Dragon's like, well, that makes sense. And Robin tells us about ancient weapons and them existing, but why did they wait till now? We already have the answer. We already know why they've been waiting till now. They didn't have a way to power it. And Vegapunk, he's provided that way. I think Dragon has to talk to either Shaka. Well, Shaka did get shot. But he has to have a conversation with Vegapunk. And to understand what Vegapunk did, and then having the best theorists around, they'll put two and two together and understand that Vegapunk actually gave him the last piece they needed would you look at that the manipulation of timelines is effortless it's 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 so uh, it's next level i really appreciate 
how Oda is, without straight up telling us, using the story to flow it in a way for us to come to our own conclusions. It's like we're finding the One Piece, right? And we're coming to our own conclusions based on the information given. It's not necessarily being spoon fed, right? It's throwing things out there and then using other characters to somewhat give us an aha moment. And in the next segment, I had an aha moment where it's like, oh, no way. You guys are gonna have the same thing if you don't know about this. Let's talk about the Garling Valley. I probably should have started with this, but rest in peace to Don Quixote Mosgard, the only celestial dragon that we can say is a good person. Now, I do think there will be more because people inspire people, right? Mosgard was not like this initially. Mosgard was the worst of the worst. But then Mosgard interacting with Queen Otohime over time, his heart was changed. So I would not be surprised if Mosgard impacted other people as well. So I expect for us to have a, a few more good celestial dragons, maybe even, maybe even some of the God Knights, Holy Knights, essentially, right? In the real world and story, you need help from the opposition, from quote unquote bad people sometimes, the bad faction for change to occur, right? Not gonna get into slavery and all that different stuff in the real world, but people that were seemingly opposed to certain things, they have had to step forward to produce change. And I think Mosgard is the first step to showing that good people or bad people can become good people. And that it's a result of your surroundings, how you were brought up. People say all the time that Doflamingo was born evil. I don't think he's necessarily born evil, but he's been put through a circumstance or situation in which raised by celestial dragons, persecuted by the people. It creates somewhat of a chemical reaction in his brain to be an evil scumbag. I love it. But now, Garling Valley. In this last section of the chapter, we see a, a figure, right? Saint Figaland Garling. A few things, because some people are confused based on why people are jumping to conclusions in regards to this connection to Shanks. Well, not only the sword, but if you haven't seen Film Red, I understand the confusion. In Film Red, the Gorosei say that quelling Uta will not be as easy considering she has Figarland blood within her. But they said Shanks did indeed have a daughter. So the question is, who's the Figarland? Shanks? or Uta. But I think the Gorosei were making their conclusions that Uta is a Fagarland because they thought Uta was Shanks' legitimate daughter. That's where we drew the conclusion that Shanks is a Fagarland. It's crazy when you first hear about it, but let's think about Shanks and the things he's accomplished. Shanks was able to meet with the Gorosei. He was able to meet with the Gorosei, a Yonko, and they met because it's him. Shanks was able to stop a war. And what did Sengoku say? Because it's you, we're able to do it. Shanks so far has been such an anomaly in the world. And when you put it together, let's say he's the son of Garling. And being the son of one of the more powerful celestial dragons in the world, not saying he has the same powerful or the same cachet as the Gorosei, but he's the supreme commander of the God Knights, who dragons seem to be more worried about than the admirals. Shanks is essentially Doflamingo, with a different agenda. Doflamingo was a celestial dragon having power but trying to eradicate the world. Shanks, seemingly so far, based on context clues, is a celestial dragon who's a Yonko who's trying to keep the world together for Luffy. I know it sounds crazy, but when you think about everything Shanks has accomplished throughout his pirate career, every single situation we've seen, it starts to make more sense. Shanks is someone that has an insane level of influence. And then I think it's a dead giveaway based on what Garling says at the end after executing Mosgard. He says anyone who protects scum is lower than the scum they protect. We find out in a recent chapter that Shanks essentially has a bunch of scum under them, under him, to protect them. Shanks' fleet weren't powerful. They were known to be weak, but he had them flying under his banner because he wanted to protect them. He is the antithesis of Garling. Garling could be the reason why Shanks feels the way he does, where no one can hurt his friends. In a roundabout way, you can say Garling is like Shanks, where someone hurt his friends, but for him, no. It's about scum. He looks at weak people as scum, people beneath him as scum. Shanks does not operate that way. Now, Garling does not necessarily have to be his dad, could be an uncle. But I think this chapter is all but confirming that Shanks is a member of the Fagarland family, but it goes so much deeper. At first, I didn't get it, right? But then again, this is the beauty of reacting to the chapter and talking to the chat and having a great time the stream will be linked below if you guys want to check it out in the stream people said well these quotes remind us of marie antoinette i'm like who's that so then i go and do my research what quote you talk about oh well they said the food supply is gone for the gorse or for the celestial dragons then they said well we have no bread all we have is cake so marie antoinette was king louis's wife right and the queen of france during the french revolution right and at some point around 1789 she was told that her subjects were starving and that they have no bread and then apparently when she was told that she said let them eat cake then what is the meaning of this? Well, this is showing just how oblivious she was in regards to her subjects and the dire straits they were in, which she did not understand that they, them not having bread obviously does not mean they don't have cake either. 
so aloof. She did not understand the conditions that her people were in or just going through in France. And this led to her demise. This fueled the revolution and she ended up losing her head in 1793. How is this significant? Well, now the Celestial Dragons, they may have sealed their fate by using this same quota. Oda might be telling us what will happen to them or even for Garland, Garling, based on this quote. He might lose his head because they are oblivious to the ordinary conditions of the people. I think it's a very interesting perspective and a, a throw in that I mean, it's beautiful because right now, the world is in the midst of a revolution. Things are changing. Some of them might lose their heads. What I loved about this, it shows Oda's awareness, attention to detail, his love for history. Oda talks all the time about like pulling different stories and inspiration from so many different ways. A Marie Antoinette quote, <laughs> I'm floored. Every single time One Piece blows me away and I, what, what do you say? what can you say but either way this is not the end of it there's more to go because we find out for garland garling is the supreme commander of the god knights right this is cool this is great he's also the former king of god valley huh why is this significant we all know god valley is where shanks was found that was confirmed in film red shanks was found by roger and Rayleigh in god valley this again ties shanks to for garland but not only that if he's the supreme commander of god valley that means more than likely he would or the former king of god valley that means more than likely he was there when roger garp and those guys were fighting against or fighting against rocks he's seen rocks he met rocks was he a part of eradicating rocks but even deeper than that right he, it goes even deeper it's crazy i made a video about it when we saw the silhouette of for Garland Garling. We said this guy could be related to Shanks. Shanks is twin, Shanks is older brother, Shanks is father. Wait, you go back to chapter 434, Whitebeard when he sees Shanks, he says, every time I see you, the scars on my face, they, they, they throb, the scars on my body, they throb. The obvious conclusion that we came to was, he's talking about Roger. Even in One Piece Data Book Yellow, it says that they're talking about Roger. It says it, so that it debunks it, right? Data Book Yellow has said a lot of wrong things because it doesn't make sense because Whitebeard did not have some of his prominent scars when he last met Roger. But if it's tied to God Valley, this doesn't make sense because he would have gotten those scars in God Valley. So what's going on? So this could be a confirmation, right? These things could be correct. This One Piece data book could be debunking this theory as far as like the man that Whitebeard was talking about because there's so many nuances with this whole theory. But the data books aren't made by Oda, right? They could be wrong. Even in the same data books, they said that Luffy and Zoro were equals pre time skip. I, mean, I don't know. Again, they are not written by Oda. So I'm not saying that this is confirming this theory, but I think it's a really interesting perspective considering just how many parts are just closely tied together. Again, a lot of these ideas I mentioned in this review, they're going to be floated about for the next couple three, four, five weeks because we are not going to have any One Piece. So we're going to expound upon them and see what we can find. We're going to go through the data books. We're going to go through the story to see the relevance of these ideas because man, Oda left us off with a banger. I know this review has been going on for a minute. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Give me your thoughts. Another thing I thought when Garland talked about scum being lower than scum, I thought about, I thought about Kakashi. It could be a nod to Kakashi and how he talked about protecting your friends or betraying your friends, whatever, whatever he said back then. I don't know. But I thought about Kakashi and then also with Garling's hairstyle. You know the Celestial Dragons, we've been, we always been talking about the Celestial Dragons and their connection to the moon and for Garling to have a crescent moon hairstyle it's like oh no are they really from space bro I, I i don't know do they really feel like they're better than other people that's why they wear their space suits it's, it's a lot there but guys you managed to make it this far i appreciate it like the video subscribe if you make it this far just let me know that you enjoy content like this and i will i will you know do this for every review well every chapter is not going to be like this one but we won't hold back we'll give you full force oh sounds a little weird either way like subscribe We'll catch you guys in the next one. Peace.